You signed up for a haunted house experience, but this is not your ordinary haunted house. Here, you'll go through hours of torture designed with you in mind, inducing psychological terror and physical injuries. For the duration of this trip to a haunted house, you can't say no. The person that brought you there ensured they've covered all of their bases legally for you not to be able to sue them. The questions we need to answer today are why. Why would people sign up to go to McKamey Manor? And why does Russ McKamey want them there? Spiritual healing. There's spiritual healing. Okay. <laughs> Today's topic, super controversial. You know what I feel would strike a very controversial chord if I was to fess up <laughs> this to you? Uh, last night, my husband, who I'm married to for almost five years, by the way, BTW, found out that I have never watched Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Is it Charlie and or Charlie in? That is how much I care. <laughs> that is how much time I have for this shit. And I have never heard his voice that way. He was genuinely petrified. He was like, what kind of psychopath are you never to have watched that cartoon? Series? Movie? Listen, I'm going deeper and deeper into this hole that I have dug for myself. So, my point being is that struck a chord. Like, he knows I research true crime cases every single week. He knows I know so many ways of how to get away with murder. But this is when he started treating me like I'm a psychopath. Cool. Now that we have that out of the way, on this channel, I often start my videos by telling you to forget everything you know about true crime, because the case I'm talking about is either not really known or is just next level crazy. Today, definitely, that rule applies, forget everything you know about true crime, because legally, legally, this isn't a true crime case. But a lot of you will agree with me that what is happening and has happened at McKamey Manor is definitely true crime. Is, to a certain degree, really torture on demand that people sign up for. And we are going to be talking about the reasons. Now, if you are an expert on this topic, if you're like, what can you offer me, you new girl, you newbie in this area, Maya, what, what are you going to be talking about? Like, I research this topic every single day. First of all, in that case, I'm kind of concerned for your mental health because just researching for this very video scarred me for life. So, there are other topics out there. Let me just say that there are other YouTube channels apart from McKamey's one to watch. But here I will focus on something that I don't think many videos on this topic have focused on, and that is the legalities of it. That is the waiver that Ross McKamey has them to sign that allows him to do all of this. So I watched a bunch of legal people, like lawyers, attorneys, legal eagle, YouTube channel that I haven't discovered until this very video, so I would definitely recommend watching them, just in general, on all of the cases, but it was super useful and very nicely explained on the waiver in particular. And then on the other end of things, we are going to be talking about why would people participate in this experience. Because, again, I watched multiple videos by people who have been scarred for life and came to YouTube to talk about it after having been to McKamey Manor. And then, in the end, you let me know. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Would you submit yourself to something like this? If so, why? If not, why again? And do you see certain true crime aspect to it? Or do you see that he has done nothing wrong? So, my is the name. Hauntsville is the game. Welcome to Hauntsville yet again. I welcome you five times a year during the month of October to this city that doesn't really exist on the map as you know it. But then once a year during the month of October, it surfaces on the map and you get to meet five people, get to learn five different stories. And if you get too close to them, they might just scar you for life. And this is the story of Ross McKamey and his manner.
Let us start this story with talking about who are the people that go through an experience like this. Because, as I mentioned in the intro, this isn't your regular haunted house experience. This isn't your producer Andy from The Ellen Show being sent to be freaked out by creatures that are just popping out from different corners and the sound effects sounding all creepy and then after a couple of minutes you leave the place and you say goodbye and you forget about it by tomorrow. The adrenaline rush is there for maybe about like five minutes after you leave the place and then you say goodbye and you forget about it until your next Halloween. McKamey Manor, according to the website, according to its owner, Russ, in its prime around 2014 and all the way up until quarantine, really, had about over 20,000 people on its waiting list. These people, prior to visiting McKamey Manor, would have already been profiled by its owner, Russ. They would have already confessed all of their fears to him before even applying to go there, before even reaching the location and signing the waiver. They would need to be 21 and above, although Russ would accept people who would be 18 to 20 with a parental approval. They would need to have completed the physical examination and provide Russ with a doctor's letter that would state they are physically and mentally clear to submit to this experience. Even before jumping on a call with Russ, they would also need to have completed a background check. After passing all of these, having a doctor's letter on hand, they would be screened by Russ McKamey himself, either via FaceTime or a call. This screening is personally done by Russ, because he would only have one single event a week, but he would treat this as making a show, as making entertainment. He would be one among the other people recording everything behind the camera. So what he needed in order to create a great show, according to him, would be the knowledge of people's fears. Once he would learn about your fears, as well as the fears of the participants that are to attend to the manor that week, he would tailor the experience towards it. Again, everything in an attempt to make for a better show, because he would end up posting the videos, very much unedited videos in most cases, onto his YouTube channel. Once you finish the call with Russ, he would tell you that you can only bring one other person along, one friend or partner, again to add to the fear, so that you can't rely on anybody else but your own coping mechanism. And not just that, but you also need to show up in an adult onesie. You can't be in normal clothes. Again, think Stanford experiment, think any humiliating effect here, where he would sell it as better entertainment, as a better show, because, you know, just showing up in regular clothes doesn't look so great on camera. But what we know, if we really just think about the psychology of it for a second, is that it's just him treating these participants as players in his own sick game, making them feel childish, further adding the dehumanizing aspect to this whole experience. As if this wasn't enough for you to actually appear on the day of the show in your onesie with one friend of yours or by yourself, you also need to provide him with a proof of your medical insurance, you need to sign a 40-page waiver, and you need to pass the portable drug test on the day of the show. Some patterns that are not in this step-by-step -step list on Russ McKamey's website that I have picked up on, just watching a ton of these videos on his channel, are that in terms of fears, yes, he would tailor them towards you, but he is quite big on certain things, like hypothermia. So regardless of your fears, what you would definitely experience is being submerged into the cold water or being shot inside of a freezer. More than one thing involving being put in water. Mm -hmm. Like more than one situation involving water. Like cold water? Like with yes. hot water? Like cold water. Or, like, freezing cold water. Um, and then... There was a casket that we put in. That was probably, like, the least scary. It's just, like, being laying in the casket. Yeah. Um, there was... Okay, so you know, like, those little... Um, the 
the ice cream slidey things at gas stations where you slide the top. Yeah. So they had one of those, and that's like the photo of me with the hand, guy's hands around my neck. Um, with the tarantula or no? No, the, the one with the slip knot. Yeah, because like your face looks like really like bruised and stuff. Like was it? Or oh yeah, no, I was. Edited? No, my face. I I got my head slammed against a wall. Yeah. <laughs> like I was. Well, I was gonna say it's like the picture looked really my like. My face is really swollen. <laughs> yeah. And I was also being like choked. <laughs> But, so the little, the little thing in the background of that photo had uh-huh. water in it. And there was, like, this much space to breathe in the water. And he put me in there. And the actor would shove my head down in the water and then let me back out. But then he shut the top. And, again, I had, like, this much space to breathe. So I'm, like, sitting in this thing. So that, was that the part when you were in Oh, no, I saw this it? one. So I know. I was. So there was more than one thing involving, like, being put in the oh, water okay. and having, like, this much air. Okay. Another thing that he's fascinated with, like to the point where you know that this is this guy's fetish and you just wonder where did you get this fixation from? And that is removal of people's hair. And I don't mean just hair on your head. Mostly focusing on shaving their eyebrows on the day. And I think this is just to add to them feeling like his puppets, to them not feeling like they are themselves during this whole experience. Another focal point for us would be the gross factor. Making people eat bugs, showering them with blood, having the volunteers that are helping him run this experience spit blood at the participants. Because of the screening process, because he actually makes you sit down and watch other people's experience before you even sign that waiver, once you're in, you are in. There is no safe word. You can't really get out. You can say that you want an out multiple times and all of those are recorded on video and all of those are recorded with a rejection from Russ. He would only let people out once they're in the state where they can't continue with this experience any longer. Usually, as I mentioned, due to hypothermia, they would be shaking, they would be in physical distress to the point where it doesn't even make for a good show for him to continue, rather than him taking care of them as actual human beings. But the whole experience is designated to make these participants fail, because nobody has actually completed the full experience to date. And we know that because there is a cash prize of $20,000 if you were to complete this experience in full with a catch where Russ McCamey, the creator of the worst of the horror shows on the planet, will deduct money from that cash prize. So even if you were insane enough to actually complete this whole process to the end, well, if you were to swear during it, he deducts the money. He takes it all away. Such, like, such a bizarre concept. I will never wrap my head around any of this. Before us going through the process now, beginning to end, once you know what you need to apply, if you are like, well, this is such a catch, I want to go onto their website, send him an email and get myself in on it. Well, first of all, you can. I would suggest watching this video to the very end and then making that decision and watching some of his YouTube videos in full. And then if you can stomach that, I guess do with your life whatever you want, but you won't need to pay for it unless the rules have changed. You will only need to pay for it in some dog food because Russ loves dogs and has dogs, so maybe equivalent of like $50 in dog food. That's all you need. That, the medical insurance, the note from the doctor, everything we spoke about, and you can be one of the many features on McKamey's Manor channel. Now let us really get into the nitty-gritty of this video, with the biggest focus of it being that waiver. Before I dive into this video, because unless it is a legal YouTube channel-specific topic, nobody really focused on the waiver in their own videos speaking about McCamey's manner, I thought it's going to be really vague. I thought it's going to be 40 pages of just the text that nobody will really be able to understand, like the legal terms, the words, that nobody will be able to get. But it's actually the complete opposite. And when you think about it, it's actually logical that it's the complete opposite. It is intentionally simplified, describing every single thing that you might or might not go through. 
again tailored to what you have previously told Russ. So if we look at number 29 on this waiver, a participant would agree to and has full knowledge that if they selected to visit the barber, they might leave McKamey Manor completely bald, including eyebrows. He would go in detail on this waiver describing what exact injuries you might endure. So if you look at point 51 on it, participant fully understands that injuries may occur. These injuries might include, but are not limited to, head, neck, back injuries, death, stroke, traumatic brain injury, loss of consciousness, bleeding, scrapes, heat stroke, just stating some of them, and none of them hold MM responsible. Nothing is excluded. You can really see that this guy put so much attention to detail here. He mentions that a participant needs to understand they may incur injuries due to the falling props in the event because they are unstable. They understand they may be in contact with carbon monoxide. They understand that panic attack doesn't count as serious injury. They need to sign that they understand that the tour is going to include hypodermic needles, zappers, tasers, or dog shock collars. That they will be crushed in a pit by various objects. That it is their responsibility not to swallow all of the fluids, including blood, grease, other liquids that might be spit or placed in participants' mouth. Things really escalate beyond the point 56, where they need to sign that they fully understand and agree they might be fish hooked, so their mouth might be ripped, then that a nail might be piercing their hand, that also their hand might be smashed with tools, that their nails might be removed from their nail beds. As if this wasn't a horror show already, this waiver just goes on to describe that they might be choked, which might cause gagging, that they understand that humiliation will occur, and that Russ is going to name-call them. So will all of the volunteers participating. You are signing up for exposure to extreme temperatures, to exposure to medication that might induce hallucinations, or sedatives that can be given to you in a pill form, or through a needle, whichever way Russ chooses to go on that day. By signing up for this, you also sign up to ingest live bugs, to be enclosed in a chamber with other live animals, all of them stated under one of the points, and also to have a plastic bag or a plastic wrap over your face, which in turn can cause suffocations, blackouts, and... MM isn't responsible or liable, of course. I cannot emphasize enough how much everything about why Russ does this is for a performance. Even so many points within this waiver are all about gaslighting you, while simply telling you what you're going to endure. He tells them they will be exposed to electrical stimulation, they might come in contact with raw sewage, and that they will absolutely get cuts, severe bruising, and or swelling due to open-handed striking on their face and other physical contact. And when it comes to the safe word, the participant is being offered a safe phrase. According to this point, there probably were different versions of this waiver, even just from how they were typed up, from what I could find online. According to this one, you are on the day offer the safe phrase, but then the next line says it is up to the participant to use this phrase due to their weakness if they feel they need such a weak precaution as a safe phrase. And then that is the only point in that waiver that I found where you actually need to circle yes or no. So you can choose never to use a safe phrase and only to be let out if you are extremely shaken up and can't really proceed. I mentioned the entertainment part really begins with this waiver, even from the tone of voice of it. But more importantly, because this is where the show begins. I am yet to see proof that a single person has signed this waiver on their own, not on the day, in the presence of other people, and in the presence of Russ. 
But now a couple of important things. I will overlay a few videos of the procedure of signing of this waiver unless I get copyrighted, in which case I'm going to put the links in the description box. Let me just describe it just in case and then tell you the opinion of the lawyers on different YouTube channels. On the day, Ross gathers these participants in their onesies and they're all handed over this 40-page waiver. Then they go in the field, this place is already in the middle of nowhere, but they go into the mud, into this field, and each and every person reads a paragraph, a point. They all participate in the contract reading, and this can last up to six hours. This can already last between usually 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. This is already part of the show because Russ is already behind the camera, sometimes even going on Facebook Live while recording, while his assistants are helping him, sometimes throw fake blood at the participants already, giving them a taste of what they're signing up for as they're reading exactly what they're going to experience sometimes dragging them through the mud, sometimes asking them to cheer on and sing a song of Russ's liking. I'm gonna hand you three forms. Each, one form each. Take this. Don't get it wet. They're uh, extremely physical and the participants may very well lead to getting there with bugs, bruises, cuts, or other possible read. injuries, yes. including possible broken bones. Participant may very well leave became unintentional emotional stress and psychological issues. The participant understands that it is never the intent of MM to cause myself and any type of psychological damage. So when you're begging and screaming for mercy and you want out of McKamey Manor, what do I do? You're not going to let me go. No, why are you doing this? That's my question. Why would you do this after everything is happening? And why would you sign this waiver? Christina, why would you do this? I don't know. Probably to push my body further than went with the first time. Is this a good idea? Probably not. Pull it out. Get Spencer in there quiet. Uh, get her up. 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 Have I discouraged you from this? Have I? Yes, you have. No, what? I didn't hear you. You get these two ladies together. You talk to them right now, because right now you're on the hot seat. Get them together, Spencer. Come on, guys. Spencer, guys. get them together. Let's read this together. Betty? Participants will read and agrees that it is participants' responsibility to read and sign the complete MM waiver before ever taking the tour. Participant agrees that they will see the waiver on the day of the tour. And participant agrees that they will not be provided a copy of such waiver. According to the Legal Eagle YouTube channel, this probably happens just as a part of the show. As in, there is probably a clean copy of that waiver that they have signed and they are just reading it out loud while being given a taste of their experience. And they are saying that because nobody sued Russ over any parts of this waiver yet, and had he really been doing this with every single group for hours before he had a signature on that waiver, that could have been considered coercion and he would be able to face some criminal charges. If we believe there is no coercion and they have actually signed this waiver and this is just part of the show, we get to the next important point, and that is consent. As mentioned, on the day, they are given a safe word. So, theoretically, if the participant is to utter that safe word, Russ should be calling it quits. He should be releasing that participant. And this partially is because of the state where the manor is, and that is Tennessee. And in Tennessee, you can withdraw your consent at any time. So, even though somebody made you sign a consent form, if you indicate that you are withdrawing consent, McKamey, in this case, should be taking you seriously. If you don't, if he was not to release this person, and he was to confine them against their will, then they're committing crime. They can be prosecuted under false imprisonment. But this is where the concept of every single part of this being a game comes into play. Because under paragraph 3 in his waiver, he states that the participant agrees that if the police are called or appear on the scene, that they need to admit that this is just a game. 
And if you recall, the waiver is detailed and quite specific for a reason. And that reason is the assumption of risk. Because you do have a right to sue if he doesn't let you get out of the game, theoretically. But in every single point of that waiver, you have assumed the risk to any of those things. And you have also been given an option to choose a safe phrase or not. So let's say if we are looking at paragraph 31 and you were to go to the police later and sue Ross McKamey for an anxiety attack that you got after being buried alive, well, then if they were to get a hold of that waiver, that wouldn't really hold grounds in court because paragraph 31 states that you can be buried alive under 12 feet of dirt and rock and that would limit the amount of air that you will receive. Or if you were to report him for all the injuries that you have sustained due to the fall, well, according to paragraph 32, you agreed to partake in a height stunt that involves walking a plank 25 feet above ground without a safety net. Plus all of the other paragraphs, all of the other points in that waiver that state all different injuries that you will most definitely get. The scrapes, the cuts, the burns, the electric shocks. All of the grounds have been covered by Russ, and this, in the court of law, makes any injury accidental, not willful. Like, he isn't aiming to get you injured, it's just that it might happen because of the nature of this whole horror show. Hearing this, what first comes to mind is, but what about negligence? Well, I have read you certain paragraphs where he again said that, you know, maybe the injury would be due to the railings being unstable. He really thought of every single thing. And for you to prove negligence, you need to prove that the breach of duty caused injuries to whoever is suing them. And the reason why Russ made this waiver so specific, it is for him to cover all of the grounds. For example, if you were to get injured, within his horror house, but then that injury doesn't get infected, doesn't lead to your death directly, for example, well then he is not liable. He is not a liable person if you leave that place and suddenly you fall ill, sick, or have anxiety for the rest of your life. And on top of that, by making sure that every person is sufficiently warned within that waiver and through all of the steps that they go through before they even show up on the day, he is making sure they are sufficiently warned about the potential hazard. Meaning that, again, if anything was to happen, he isn't liable because he didn't intend for it to happen. According to the Legal Eagle YouTube videos, this is all valid unless it is gross negligence. And this is the next level because A, a participant would need to prove that the person, Russ, acted with ordinary negligence and then additionally to prove they acted with indifference towards the safety of others. So if we were to focus on one of Russ's favorites, hypothermia, submerging people into extremely cold temperatures, into extremely cold water, well, if you were to die from it without anybody there, including Russ and including his volunteers, spots it in time, then yes, your family can sue him for gross negligence. But usually, because he is so experienced in all of this, because he has really seen it all, he will be able to spot exactly the moment when you can't resist it any longer and then pull you out of the game. By which point, yes, you have lasting consequences, if on nothing else, your mental health. But that's just enough for him never to be able to be sued by you or anybody else for gross negligence. Once the waiver is signed, one of the participants, one of the volunteers at the manor sort of takes you over the shoulder and they bring you inside of the manor for the torture session to begin. And this haunted house visit can last from anything between two to six or eight hours. If YouTube allows it, I will overlay some of the more disturbing footage as I'm speaking about the experiences now. Just a trigger warning if you don't want to be scarred for life or just don't want to stomach it right now. 
maybe just don't watch, like listen to the audio version of this video in the background while not actually watching it until I stop talking about the experience. And that is because reading it within a waiver is one thing, but then actually watching it happen to other people, the real horror on their faces is completely different. The participants get locked in freezers, they get slapped by the volunteers, they get kicked, they can be held underwater, they're injected by drugs of McCain's choice, they're recorded facing live animals or consuming live bugs, different parts of their bodies get injured from having their nails ripped off, bones broken, hair and eyebrows shaved, or teeth removed in certain cases. Many people that have since moved on from working for McKamey that have spoken up or, I mean, I guess that they have their own version of a waiver, their own NDAs that they had to sign to work there in the first place. But what they managed to reveal is that most of the footage on his YouTube channel is watered down. That he actually edits most of those videos so that not everything is open for the public, which begs you to think... What does he do? How does he consume? How does he enjoy the rest of the footage? The most disturbing things, like if this is what's watered down, what else is out there? And that begs for another question, or why? Why does he do it? Because even without searching for his Social Blade account, you know that YouTube won't allow him to monetize any of those videos, so he isn't profiting from that. He only makes the participants pay in dog food, so he isn't actually monetizing on that, and he probably spends more money on the legalities of it, making sure that those waivers are up to date with the laws in the state that he has the manner in. We'll speak a bit about Russ's background, or what is known of it, rather, a bit later in this video, but just food for thought for now... How else would you think that he might be making profit out of these videos, or rather the unreleased footage? Is there a possibility that he is selling it, whether it is on the dark web, or, you know, underground, he lives in the middle of nowhere, he might be actually putting it on DVDs and CDs and selling it to other people? Because how is he actually sustaining even the bare minimum of his lifestyle. He isn't paying the volunteers, but the question is, how is he buying all of the props? How is he paying for the house that he is living in? Just something to think about as we go along. Further within this haunted house, just as you might think it's soon going to come to an end, you're going to endure a couple more props, and you might be closer to winning $20,000, you start being exposed to mind-altering drugs or different weapons, inducing further levels of pain. This is also when most of the features that you will experience would start becoming increasingly tailored to your own fears. And during all of that time, Russ is simply behind the camera, recording, advising the volunteers to name-call you, to call you weak if you want to quit, to keep repeating that you need to stay and you need to continue. And on the other end of that, you just keep telling yourself that you will be fine. This is from an interview of one of the survivors of McKinney Manor. Because again, you are panicking, but like the entire, it's not, it's not what you think it would be because the entire time you're trying not to panic. Yeah. So you're just trying to tell yourself, because if you let your, for me, again, that's why I had the panic attack, like in the thing is because I started thinking about it too much and I was okay. like, you can't, you just have to, like, stop thinking about it so much and just say, this is a hot house. But on purpose, you, like, choke you to Right, they're not going to do something like that. Right. Yeah, okay. No, but, like, a normal, like, the one that we did at the Queen Mary, mm -hmm. the last one, that was, like, creepy, and we were in there for a while. Yeah. So imagine that feeling that you had for, like, six hours. Yeah, okay. And just, like, never went away. So the entire time, you're just trying to tell yourself, this is just a haunted house, this is just fake, like, you're going to be, like, that's literally, that was what I was telling myself in my head. Like, this is fake, you're fine, don't freak out. It's okay. This is what's supposed to be happening. Yeah, like that's just what I was trying to yeah, tell myself. So once you can't tell yourself any longer that you will be fine, once you show signs of distress to a degree where you are shaking, you break and you can't move on, that is the only time that you will be removed from the game. Say goodbye to $20,000 
and end up leaving that experience with long-lasting damages to your body and also to your psyche. But this is not the end. Russ might wrap a towel around you, he might get you to a warm place, and as soon as you feel like you are safe again and you might be able to leave, you need to record one last thing for us. You need to record an exit interview. People have said that in these exit interviews, Russ would, before turning the camera on, say that if they don't say all the good things about the manor, that he is going to sue them for $50,000 and that they signed a waiver saying that that can happen. So under all the stress, you rest, you can't even process, you can't even think about what you signed, all of the points in that waiver, you buy into it and he switches on the camera and you say, oh my god, this was the best experience. It was so exhilarating. I would recommend it to everybody. And then you leave. Now that we have gone through the experience from beginning to end, let us focus on each of the different parties. The kidnappers, the volunteers that work on his manner, then the participants, and finally end with Russ. In order to understand better as much as we possibly can, why each of these parties would engage in such an experience. The least amount of information that I could find online was on the volunteers. I found an interview with one of the people that worked and then has left the farm that accused Russ of many things. But again, as I mentioned, they must have NDAs that are not made public, even on Reddit or anywhere, because I couldn't find them. I don't know if you did or if you can publicly speak about your experience of working on the manor, get in touch, but I doubt, because I think that would be one of the more interesting perspectives to find out about, and it's just not there. What I could find is that there is about half dozen kidnappers that are volunteer actors that originally come as guests, so they participate first, and then they return to torture the others, to get the others to experience what they have. The threads that I found about the guy that exposed Russ, he had a Facebook page that was called The Truth About McCamey Manor, and this page would accuse Russ of recklessly endangering people by not properly training them. And during some period of time, he used to hire just anybody. He wouldn't do background checks on them, while he would do extensive background checks on the participants. So at some point, he even had a pedophile running the show, and then once he had a participant who was under the age of 21, with the parental consent, he figured out that this pedophile volunteer is kind of interested in this participant, and then he had to get rid of him. There just isn't enough knowledge on those people, but if we are to believe even this limited information, it is a thriving ground for anybody who is a sadist, in a way, because they won't be monitored, they're not really getting paid, so it is truly something that they do for their own satisfaction, for their own pleasure, and nobody's really even checking their background, they're not checking their record. It is a thriving space for somebody who once a week wants to participate in torturing other people for hours on end, only then to be able to commemorate that and watch his own doing, something that he caused other people, again for pleasure online, on hours and hours on end, through YouTube, through his own website, hearing other people's story, describing their own effects. I don't have a doubt that any single one of these volunteers has some serious mental health problems and some serious sadistic intentions in order to just even be in charge of one single of these experiences, because these are hours on end that you're watching people go through agony. Taking that into consideration, it won't come as a surprise then when we start talking about the participants and why some of them go through this experience. Some of them would go through this experience because they consider themselves to be masochists. One of the participants said, some people climb Mount Everest. This is another challenge. You want to be the first person to conquer it. In your head, it's torture, but it's a show. If it felt like torture, was it not therefore torture? I'm a masochist. A lot of it doesn't bother me. 
There are people like Christina Buster, who you must have seen in some of these videos that I have overlaid, has done it for the thrill of it. She has actually gone through the manor a couple of times, and she said she never felt tortured or abused. Rather, the experience pushed her to her limits, she's proud of herself, and she's proud of herself because she still holds the record for the oldest person to go through with it. There's other version of Frill. There was this guy that gave an interview saying that he found an experience therapeutic in a way. He missed the adrenaline rush that he used to have when he served during the army. After he left the army, he tried feeling that rush with different activities, like skydiving, bungee jumping, rock climbing, but he doesn't get the same rush from jumping out of a plane anymore. He said none of these experiences compared, because none of them compared to you just sitting in a van, locked and loaded, saying your last prayer, and going outside a wire. It's very hard to replicate that, and that Russ just managed to get the closest to his army experience that he'd ever come. If we are to consider multiple different profiles of the participants, he said something that most of the people belonging to the Frio Seekers group have said, and that is that you know you are not going to die in the manner, but it is the illusion of you being unsafe that gives you the thrill. Now, we spoke about the possible masochists, the people that do it for all the wrong reasons, really, and just because it is for free, and I suppose it is a form of pleasure that they get out of it, the same way that the volunteers get a different kind of pleasure. Then we spoke about the second biggest group, probably, the thrill seekers, the people that do it just because they want some excitement in their life. And now let's speak about the third largest reason of why somebody would go through with something like this, and that is to conquer their own fears. I will leave a video and the timestamp in the description box if you want to watch it, because I don't think this is my story to share. It's not even about the copyright reasons. But there was this woman who shared with Lowy Lane of just how strong her eating disorder was, and that she went through something like this in particular to face that. She believed if she was to go through this haunted house, if she was to squash all of the other fears, once she gets out, she will be able to squash her eating disorder. It's that type of mentality, like, if I can surpass this, I can surpass everything. And even if you disagree with that, even if you find that to be illogical in a way, just think of a fear that you have that paralyzes you. The fear that many people won't really treat as such, that maybe they will find laughable. But that also you can't really reach the core of. You don't know where the trauma started, and you might not have the money to pay for the certain types of therapies that will be able to help you out with that, because this is, again, very particular niche of people that will help you out deal with fears that will probably cost a lot of money for, or hypnotists, people that will put you under hypnosis for you to relive these traumas, for you to be able to work on conquering or starting to conquer those fears. Because you don't have the resources, because you don't have the money, that fear is just getting more and more intense. It paralyzes you. It stops you from living your life to the fullest potential. If you were to face whatever is the source of that fear, you'd rather jump onto the road, jump onto the motorway, rather than face whatever that fear is. Now a friend of yours suggests you and them go for this experience. You don't even have to pay any money for it. You go to the doctors, you get a doctor's note, you have some screening with him that probably doesn't even last that long. And what? You go there, spend a couple of hours in this haunted house, face all of those fears, and you get out. Maybe, maybe, just maybe it works. It's easier for me to understand the desperation of the people mixed with the curiosity, like, will it work? I might as well try it, because I'm left with no other options. Then to understand why he does it. So, let us speak about Russ. Everything I'm to tell you about Russ McKamey 
take it with a grain of salt because there's only one podcast episode that I found that sort of speaks about some details of his childhood and a lot of it refers to certain Reddit threads and YouTube videos that have since been removed. So I'm not sure if they were removed for privacy guidelines, did he complain, was it some of his family members speaking up? So take everything with a grain of salt and everything is really ambiguous to begin with. We don't even have his date of birth and place of birth. We know that there was something that left an impression on young Russ, though. As a kid, Russ would go trick-or-treating with his dad, and this is where he would see his first makeshift cardboard maze on somebody's lawn. He said that when he saw this maze, somebody building a cool little world in their own backyard, he thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and this is what got him hooked to create his own. Because of this, and because he realized he is talented and passionate about acting, about music and filmmaking, this is where his life would lead him to. So, during the high school and his college years, he would major in arts. After that, he would serve in Navy for about 22 years, and he was said during his Navy time to have produced horns on board, as in on board of the naval ships while out in the sea. You can see that a lot of these things might be just actual speculation. After his Navy years, he started up a Facebook page about being a wedding DJ and an entertainer. I'm not sure if he was ever hired for any of those gigs, but that page exists out there on the internet. And then, since 2000s, he actually started building his own haunted house in his own backyard. In his prime time, McKamey Manor consisted of five locations, but he really only supported himself with $800 monthly from the retirement that he got from the Navy. So, in order to support his dream and these locations, he started a GoFundMe campaign to help him cover the costs of it. And he was, as I mentioned, charging customers only in up to $200 in dog food. So, you can see how five locations, him not really charging any money for it, would lead to him going in debt. He would estimate that including the props, including the insurance, including the on-site EMT, every single haunt would cost him about $500. And in 2012, he was already a quarter of a million in debt, just based on him not paying his income taxes. Finally, him being in the red for this long would cause him to close down the first house in San Diego in 2015. By 2018, he only had two houses left. In Alabama and Tennessee, we don't know much about the Alabama one. The one in Tennessee is where most of the things have happened, where he would have this extensive waiver based on the Tennessee laws, and where the location would still remain to operate as a non-profit. In terms of his personal life, here, as I mentioned, I'm basing this off of a single source. His dad apparently committed suicide when he was still young, and as we know, his dad left a lasting impression on him as a child. He was married, and his ex-wife spoke publicly about how he might be dangerous, how certain family members actually believed that he might be a pedophile himself, but a lot of people disagreed with her on this. Russ's daughter, in some YouTube videos that are now deleted, used to say how her dad had OCD and bipolar disorder, and she claimed how Russ would actually try to commit suicide in front of her to get her to stay at home, and also he would try to commit suicide in front of his own mother and stepmother. But Russ that he wants us to see is this polished version, who doesn't drink, who doesn't use drugs, who doesn't swear himself and doesn't want others to swear, while he does want to inject other people with drugs as they're going through a haunted experience. This is how Russ sees himself. Popping is the scariest thing for, and that's that's one that's one way I got her in because I promise her, like, I promise you, Grace, I won't lock you in the coffin. I want out. I want out. This is bad karma. But <laughs> that locked her in. Of course, it locked her in. No. Grace, one more time. No. Grace, one more time. No, Russ. That's no. That's not happening. Grace, Grace, Grace. I 
tricked her into the hunt three different times. And why? Why? Because I want the footage. That's why. Because I'll do anything to get that special footage. There's live snakes in this room, Grace. Oh, God. You said there was... We lied. So will I do and say just about anything? I guess I will. Because as a filmmaker, you're thinking about the shot. Is it is it a control issue? Is it about power? Is it is it fun to see people freaked out and screaming? And I mean, what kind of person does that? According to him, it is a live theatrical performance. He does this for the views, and he does this because he's passionate about it. But it's also just smoke and mirrors. And according to him, the reason why he does it is for the entertainment, for the guys that really also enjoy doing it, for the fans, because in his opinion, this extreme haunted house is an art form. I went back to one of my favorite people to speak about David Ferrier. If you haven't watched the video on Tickled, please watch that. It's so amusing. But since then, as promised, I went on Netflix to watch Dark Tourist. And they do a segment of only like 15 minutes. It's the last episode and David Ferrier goes to visit McKamey Manor and just to sort of speak to him and be like, again, why do you do it? And according to that footage, McKamey says that he is an entertainer. That's how he perceives himself. He is a comedian, not a psychopath. Not, there's no dark side to it. As he said over and over again, it's all smoke and mirrors. But if he was only an entertainer, there are a couple of questions that I have for him. Number one, there are plenty of people that have alleged that he still edits those videos down. There are plenty of people that accused of him, the participants, after watching the footage, that he doesn't include the most brutal ones, that he doesn't include all of the times that they have said that they want to leave. If he is truly doing this purely for entertainment purposes, why not include everything in? Then there's another horror story that I haven't shared with you yet of this woman who was actually cheating on her husband. And during his background search on this woman, because as we know, he searches on their fears, he probably looks them up on all of the social media and everything else. So during that research, he actually found that out about her. And then Russ took it upon himself to expose this woman to her husband. So as she was going through a divorce, she still decided to go ahead with this haunted house experience because what else does she have to lose? And Russ, based off of her background, made her experience even more hellish than usual, than what you saw in most of these videos. He made this woman dig her own grave and then gave her a straw that would be her only way to actually inhale air. But this straw, because it is soil where she's lying down, would be getting full of sand. She was also beaten, slept around, and she would endure injuries onto her open wounds. Purely based off of the background check that Russ has done, and decided that this is the punishment that she deserved. Before I share my final thoughts, where is this place now? According to some of the interviews that I have listened to, the McKamey Manor has been shut down. The website is still up and you can technically still email him, which I'm not sure if there was another way to get into the experience before, like was there ever a form on their website or how would people apply to begin with? And I mean, there's still steps of how to apply. He still has a Facebook page running. So I'm not really sure if this is still happening. According to certain sites, I have seen that it still is, but there's only one single location left. But there are no posts or videos of the experiences since 2016. There was also a GoFundMe page in 2019 to close down McKamey Manor. So, the lack of recent Google searches and any videos posted anywhere online would lead you to believe that this is closed indefinitely, that this is no longer happening. But what if it is? What if he is still running the show, just not posting the videos, or he has a backload 
or footage that he might still be distributing somewhere. Because something tells me that based off of the psychology of this guy who really gets the thrill of doing this, whether it is for right reasons, however you decide to see this, that he can't really stop. He lived his dream for a couple of years, he had multiple locations. For him to give up on this, I just don't see it happening. And another thing that makes me believe that even if he did give up on it temporarily during quarantine, during the lockdown periods, that he might not forever. Because the place where McKamey Manor is based now is in Summertown. He found a really small place that has a population of around 900 people. Because it's such a small place, the community leads non-traditional lifestyles. They're not really incorporated into each other's lives. They don't really care about who the new inhabitant is or what they're getting up to. Meaning that he might have found a perfect isolated spot to get away with on-demand torture. The conclusions that I made, the thoughts that really resonated with me and the patterns I picked up on, is how many times Russ said during those videos the words, you really don't want to do this. It's on his website, it's on like the posters, it's literally on the ads online, on the Facebook group. And then even before they read the waiver, he tells them again and again, are you sure? Because you really don't want to, this is just a taste of what is coming. And I feel there's a reverse psychology of it, because when you tell somebody you really don't want to do this, you're a coward, can you even handle this? Well, you're gonna be like, no, I want to do it. Because yes, I can handle my fears, I can face my fears, that's why I came here in the first place. And another thing that people don't point out is that technically you realize, even before going into this experience, that there is no reward. I don't know even if he has those $20,000 based on his financial history, but you know that nobody went through it. Nobody got that reward before. So even if you're going with a monetary gain prospect, at some point the prospect of that reward gets replaced by the prospect of survival. Even if you as a participant get yourself to the stage where you believe that it isn't real, it's happening. You're feeling it on your skin. You're feeling it on your body. You really, at certain points, believe that you are fighting for your life. And he's not letting you go, just enhancing that belief further. What I'd like to know your opinions on is, do you consider what you have seen during this video to be torture? Do you think that the manor should be shut down indefinitely, never reopened, maybe the channel removed based off of the opinions of the participants, of course? And also, if there was an option of a deep dive here, like, which area would you want to know more answers to? Mine would obviously be Russ's background in order to describe the psychology about this. I definitely believe him that there is a fascination about filmmaking, about the entertainment, that he is partially doing it for that. He's partially doing it for the shock effect. But then I also have to wonder, what is he personally getting out of this experience? How much is he actually getting off of setting all of this up? Because technically, he could have as much seen, I don't know, a dollhouse, a Barbie house in somebody's backyard and be like, let me build tree houses, doll houses. Why did it have to be a haunted house? And and another thing that I would very much like the answer to is, how does he pay his lawyer? Because he has clearly found enough loopholes for this not to be considered criminal, even if somebody was to report it, even if the police gets called, even if somebody sues his ass. And that must have cost money just for that waiver to be made. And that doesn't seem to be making any money. Personally, I find these stories where the topic of consent is really debatable and up for discussion to be really interesting. So if you know of any other stories like this, let me know and I will cover them on the channel. I've done the whole month on the podcast of assisted suicides and that's again why I understand better the level of desperation some of these people would go through in order to submit themselves to something like 
this extreme haunted house experience. I understand personally because I have a ridiculous fear of mine where I am the person that would jump in front of a car and rather be killed by a car than by an animal. And just like when I covered those three cases, you understand the desperation that the victims, the survivors, go through. And on the other end, again, you lack to understand the reasoning behind why the perpetrators, why the organizers, why the Russ McCainis of this world would create such experiences. In the assisted suicide, of course, completely different environment. But also those perpetrators, if they managed to prove that the victim wanted to die, they would get a lighter sentence, they would get manslaughter, they might not even serve any time in prison, depending on the level of consent. Which is something that I see so much of in this case, where Russ made sure that he knows of the legal actions people can take against him, and that he works around them, in order to satisfy his own weird, morbid desires. Let me know what your thoughts are on this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more dark content. And I shall be seeing you, I think, later this week, if I don't collapse again and just get, um, get hit by a windshield when inside of a bus. That was weird. Listen to the outtakes. I don't want to explain it again. <laughs> <laughs> just leave this video right now until everybody is still like mentally okay. They're not. They're scarred for life just by watching this. What the fuck are you on about? This is like the most morbid video that you have ever made. And I love you for watching. I love you <laughs> for watching. Thank you for doing this with me. It's a therapy experience for both of us. Okay. <laughs> but, but watch him. Does anybody see him? <laughs> But look at it, look at the picture. Hey, this comes from a person that doesn't really have the best teeth, okay? They're quite like yellowish and stuff. But still, I don't know why it's more illogical to me that like his frontal ones are so yellow and then the ones in the back are a lot whiter, like crystal clear white. Because, you know, these are the ones you kind of focus more on. Like, yes, you also use them more for eating and stuff, but it just doesn't make sense to me. What do you think about Russ's teeth? <laughs> okay, okay, microphone check, microphone check. So, um, you know what? These past seven days have been such shite that I might actually start believing in that Mercury retrograde astrology bullshit. Today, guys, I cannot make this shit up. I was literally kissing the freaking windshield of a bus. <laughs> I don't know how I'm still alive, let's just be honest. The motherfucker did not care. There's some bus drivers, they just wake up on the next level. Literally, I was like tapping my phone. The guy already drove off. He did not wait for me to tap, to sit down like a peaceful normal person. No, he was driving off. So, of course, I was trying to stabilize myself while being in like some arch, like skiing position. That is not how people ski, Maya. For minutes, for minutes, until like I tapped my freaking contactless and then try to stabilize myself while this guy is speeding towards the next bus stop. He does not care. So that was, you know, <laughs> me replaying. Safe to say I was replaying my whole life in those moments. But boy, if I was really to replay my life, it would have been last week because I had some flu that took me out. If anybody wondered, if anybody cared, and was wondering why the hell didn't I post more than one weird video last week, you know? Did I give up on the whole Hornsville situation? No! It was the fact that I was in bed with my legs too weak to move for like three days. I don't know what it was. I don't know, but I had the worst migraine of my life. I thought my head was going to detach itself. Some of the worst flu symptoms. I'm going to book a flu shot as well. I have had two vaccinations. I don't care. I don't care how many vaccines are in me. I just want my immune system to do its own thing. Why is it so hard? Now that I have your attention, what is everybody's opinion on life? <laughs> Let's just have a have a deep chat. I just went on TikTok, but they don't care about me this way, like you guys do, right? Right? So, <laughs> I had a whole rant. I recorded like three TikToks for two hours. Everything 
is going backwards today. So why not speak about it here? So does everybody else feel like deep down inside in their core that they will lead a short life? Like you cannot imagine yourself beyond a certain age. You know other people that have retirement plans, they know exactly where they want to be, they know they want this amount of children and this amount of grandchildren, they're like, this is how my life is gonna go. I'm all pro that, but that's not where I see myself going. And people usually, well, by people I mean my friends who I would start this topic with, would be like, well, you just don't have enough goals, you know? You have to have goals for your 30s, then your 40s, then your 50s. And I don't think it's that. I think it's genuinely that I know that I ain't about to lead some long-ass life. And I don't want to, trust me, my back pain already at the sorry-ass age of almost 29 is killing me, so... You know, just want to have a bit of a career in doing this, maybe, and then fuck it, you know. <laughs> I have, listen, if anybody was to be trusted, it's me. I have a really close, morbidly close relationship with my great-grandma, who is in her late 80s, and I don't want to live in pain, taking this many medications, just being housebound like her. You know, I'm kind of housebound in my 20s, but you know what I mean. I see it, I see it, I'm close to this woman and I don't want it, I don't want it, and it's okay, I'm gonna die young and it's okay, but not yet, that was the point, that was where that sentence was going, I was sick, you almost got rid of me, I was saying my goodbyes, but I knew I ain't dying right now. <laughs> Hey, it helps me cope with death, okay? I don't know how to cope with death or grief in general because I never had somebody really, really close to me die. So this is what helps. So, you know, whatever works for anybody. Also, I just wish that people use the same visualization techniques when they're like, I don't know, planning to become a mother. Like, can you imagine yourself as a mother, sleep deprived, postnatal depression, pregnant in the first place? Raising that child, reading all the parenting books, watching YouTube kids. Can you? Can you? Or is this your lifestyle? Let's just be honest and maybe visualize that and then decide, do I want to be a parent? This is going places and also nowhere. Let's do this. <laughs> this is your microphone check. <laughs> this is for 15 minutes. This is why you record for five hours.